Okay, so how many uh, of those of you here, here tonight, how many of you were not at the first meeting Tuesday night? Okay, so we got a few of you. For those of you who haven't met him, this is Ian Lockwood. He's with Dual Design Group out of Florida. They've been in this room for the past three days for about 12 hours a day working on their findings. They have some what they call starter ideas. And we've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm not going to take any more time. Here's Ian Lockwood.
The key is how do you pay for all this and how do you keep it aligned with your, your vision? Um, oh, and, and then inner city ideas like um, the town branch project, uh, what to do in, in some of the more um, underdeveloped parts of downtown. So all these things require a collective vision and money. And so the comp plan is about advancing your collective vision and creating an environment where you will have the funding to to continue to to purchase and make the things that you, you want in your city. So the whole idea is regulating the place in accordance with community's values and context. So that's the whole idea. And if you recall, these four questions were all set up to find that what find out about those values. We asked you directly about your values, uh, what you wish to preserve, what you wish to change, and what you wish to create. And all these are value-based things. You can start seeing the theme, right? Um, totally about values. And this is the online survey that 600 people took. Um, so we had a really good sample size. And this is about the um, first impressions of the city. And so we have a strong consensus of changing the streetscape um, and the, the signs and so forth to make the arrival experience down any of the five or six major streets into the city uh, a much nicer experience. That will also help the businesses down those same uh, corridors as well. And then we had a, a strong consensus of mixed use development in the downtown so people have housing choices that is within a close walk of, of um, stores and restaurants and that sort of thing. We had a strong support for infill development. There's a lot of uh, vacant properties that we'd like to see um, built on, and underutilized properties, uh, revitalized, this sort of thing. And then, um, yeah, uh, more, more dense type housing, townhouses and that sort of thing. The, the lots that have been built in the downtown have been uh, occupied and, and successful. There's a market for many more of them, and that will also help your downtown. And then, this was a big one. There's a lot of folks are very uh, strongly aligned with the character of the place, the historic character of the place, and I'd like to see that continue um, be enhanced with the existing buildings and, and reflected in the new buildings as well. So there, there's um, some strong direction there. And so this is a sample of um, some of the, the uh, exercises we did with folks over, last, over this week. And here's, um, here's some ideas of what we heard. Um, there was literally hundreds and hundreds of pieces of input, and so we put it into what's called a Wordle, and, and a lot of the things that were mentioned a lot came out, and they're, they're reflected in the larger font. So um, folks like some of the street work that's been done, how they want um, family-friendly shopping options. Small town values came through very strongly. Respect the history. More um, jobs, higher value jobs, um, restaurants, walking and biking came through. Um, also, we heard during our stakeholder meetings, gathering places are important, um, businesses are coming, uh, some more interest industries coming. This charm um, was preserved downtown, and we need to keep spreading that. The parks and trails, people want to build on that. Um, high quality of life, people people are enjoying a higher quality of life with what's going on. What's not working, um, the utilities aren't working, we're not keeping up with the maintenance on our water, sewer, streets. The arrival in the downtown um, isn't very pleasant. The signs, a lot of rundown properties, uh, parking issues. By the way, if you don't have a parking problem downtown, <laughs> downtown's probably not very nice. Every nice downtown has a parking issue because more people want to get there than space is allocated. But how it's managed is key. <coughs> Clean streets. Um, so these are the things that aren't, aren't working. And then other things that, um, during our discussions, rewarding sprawl, a lot of the, um, the, the system is set up to allow development on the edges be advantaged over infill and reinvestment in the existing neighborhood. So we want to change the climate so that it's easiest to reinforce the existing neighborhoods and the empty lots and the reinvestment into the, the I call it the pentagon, this kind of a pentagon shape around 
the city of the, the streets within that central sort of Pentagon area, as opposed to continually on the edge of town. Rewarding the long trip, that's related. A lot of the street designs are designed to kind of evacuate people out to, to outside of the Pentagon, as opposed to um, slower, safer, more comfortable, more inclusive, walkable, bikeable streets, business-friendly streets within the, the city itself. Um, and so these, these sorts of things are, are rather unsustainable and unaffordable. We'll go into more detail on that in a moment. The aging infrastructure, I think um, something like 30% of your um, uh, underground utilities are over 50 years old when they start to crumble, kind of like myself. <laughs> Um, and in 20 years, um, like 70% of your infrastructure will be over uh, 50 years old. So your maintenance isn't keeping up with the age of the infrastructure. And right now you don't have the money to do that, so we have to figure out how do we, how do we change that dynamic such that you kind of pay as you go so you don't arrive at some sort of catastrophic end of your financial road where all you're doing is fixing broken pipes and you can't do anything else that you want to do. So what's happening now isn't sustainable, but if we take some actions now, then we can avoid some really serious problems uh, in the future. And then building on the success of the downtowns, and particularly in the neighborhoods, um, good things are happening on the outside of town, in the kind of the, the ex-urban areas. Good things are happening in the downtown, and um, we need to start um, focusing some attention, particularly on the infrastructure of the neighborhoods, code enforcement, these sorts of things. So this requires um, sustained and targeted investments. So this is a, um, a map from 1930 of Sulphur Springs. This is way before the interstate came through. And you had a beautifully connected network of streets. Uh, it was the center of the whole uh, Hopkins County. And if you went downtown, everything you needed was there. Uh, from shoe stores to clothing stores, you were an independent place. And, and the most valuable area was right in the core. And then it went down the, what we call the farm to market roads and, and out into the rural areas, which for the, the more affordable land and the more valuable land was, was right downtown. And this is where all the social and economic exchange happened, right here in the core. There's another picture from back then. So you can find anything here. And the values that got you, which were important in 1930, which we heard expressed today, were what we call traditional values. Uh, it talks about um, community characters, uh, social cohesion, um, the public good, the community vision, accommodating many users, making places, um, integrating, safe speeds, accessible, particularly for the businesses, for business success. Um, nurturing businesses, adding character, strong identity, better health, this, these sorts of things were valuable during our discussions this week. And you can tell by the design of the community, by the mapping and the pictures, that those sorts of things uh, existed in 1930 as well. So there's kind of three contexts in the city, and if you um, wish to regulate your city according to your values, it speaks to these three contexts, your urban context, your, your suburban context, and your rural context. I'll just um, go into a little more detail on those. Oh, sorry. In each context, there's, so the rural, suburban, and urban context, there are neighborhoods in all three, there are districts, and there are what we call corridors. I'll just take a look at a couple of those. So this is an urban neighborhood, and so you got a regular block structure, streets, you know, buildings facing the streets. And this is a district like the downtown district where you have um, buildings next to each other and so forth, framing, framing the square. And then you have corridors like, like Main and uh, Oak and these sorts of corridors coming in, uh, Church Street. And then the same in the suburbs. You've got, um, you've got neighborhoods. They're, the blocks tend to be a little bigger. Um, the houses don't front the streets quite the same way. Um, 
you've got districts as well. Um, and when we regulate suburban areas, what we'd like to do is change from the sort of the random uh, suburban development where each developer works um, just to maximize their own utility, but there's not really a relationship between what one is doing compared to the other. And to start to organize through regulations how how the developments um, work out such that over time these could either intensify, urbanize, uh, and have value over time. Right now, if if one goes uh, if one use goes dark, it stays empty for a little while until the whole thing gets torn down. These create some synergies that help the whole suburban area stay healthier over time. So this development right now, this one for example, used to be a, a mall, and now it's a suburban uh, suburban center. But you can see that there's a bit of a, a block structure implied in the development. Um, if it were to intensify, you could imagine new buildings getting placed on the edges of the parking lots, and so it has residual value over time. Um, so we'd like to regulate according to that. And then you have uh, suburban corridors as well, which, um, which we're all pretty familiar with, except it wouldn't be nice if they were more walkable and bikeable um, and have you know, connected properties and that kind of thing. So this is the sort of thing that we can regulate in the suburban areas. So when you put it all together, you've got your urban context, your suburban context, and your rural context, and each one has neighborhoods, districts, and corridors. And if we regulate to those, then we can advance your values. Right, right now you have a land use type zoning and so forth, and, and that um, is it has nothing to do with what everyone told us was important. Um, it talks about uses and that kind of thing. Um, but this is what everybody was saying was important. So there's, there's lots of different ways to regulate, and so we're suggesting this structure um, for, for regulating your city. And that's the intent. Um, as you grow, the place gets higher quality and higher value. So I just want to tell a little story now. I want to kind of break from Sulphur Springs for a moment. Um, to outline a, a change that happened in planning probably in the 1910s and 1930s that was called modernism. And I'm going to use Detroit as the example. So this is Detroit. And uh, after the Second World War, Detroit had about two, 2 million people, about 1.8 million people. And they had a beautiful traditional network of streets with um, trolleys and, and everything focused on the, on the downtown. Bit. And that was the most important, valuable area. Somewhat like you have here with your network of streets and your diagonal streets all coming into your downtown. And, and after the Second World War, they embraced this idea of modernism. And modernism was um, one of the uh, tenets of modernism when you could drive everywhere quickly. And so they, they got rid of their trolley lines and they blasted highways through and widened streets and ended up devaluing um, the core of their city and exported the value to Wayne County outside the city. And of the 1.8 million people that lived in Detroit, about 1.2 million of them left the city. And you can see this here on a smaller scale with the um, Gilmer Oak was, was one way and sped up. Um, and the idea was to get people down the interstate quickly and, and out um, different places. So the downtown devalued, if you recall the photographs, and what didn't be value was this, the suburbs. So as, as we speed up and make the downtown streets more auto-oriented and faster, it tends to export the value of the city, or the downtown, to the outside of the city. So that happened in Detroit, and it, and it happened um, here as well on, on a small scale. So here's one of their highways they built into their downtown, which really killed the old uh, traditional neighborhoods. They had these beautiful old neighborhoods, and, and they, um, they declined. They weren't being invested in, the infrastructure was falling apart, and uh, they were too busy building highways and roads out in the suburbs. So this should sound very familiar because we're doing it here on a, on a small scale. So what we're doing in Detroit is we're stitching back the network, uh, two-way streets, and um, in fact we're, we're taking this highway out and replacing it with a boulevard. And so here, if you recall, we two-way the streets, we reconnected the network, um, and it added value, and value is value coming back to the city. So modernism brought a lot of good things, but one of the things it brought, um, like modernism,
background music and so forth um, and art. But one of the canons of modernism was high speed um, car traffic. And this is Cabuzier, he's one of the fathers of modernism. modernism. Here's one of his famous quotes Cars, cars, fast, fast. They're really deep stuff. Um, <laughs> so he would, that was his chant, that was his big idea. And so they designed high speed arterials and highways. And the idea was just to um, connect the objects in the landscape. And the fabric didn't matter. And if you look at the design of kind of the Broadway Gilmer corridor, that is designed for getting through quickly. And what's on the edge is all those businesses and so forth. Uh, that's called the fabric. According to modernism, that's not important. But here, those jobs, those businesses, those services, they are important. And connecting the cross, um, that's a bit of a barrier uh, east-west in the community, um, just like these highways are. So one of the things that's one of your values is, is connectedness. And so that the design of that street um, is out of line with your, your values. It doesn't mean that you can't have the volume or the businesses or the trucks or the fire route and so forth. Just the, um, it just has to be done in a way that conforms to your, your, uh, your values. So the modernists developed all these models of high speed travel. The, the um, industrialists got behind it. Well, solve the problem of the city by leaving the city. You know, it's sort of exporting people out to the suburbs. And they had all kinds of crazy ways of where these highways were going to go. They're going to have these sort of Jetson type things. You could visit the Grand Canyon or go to Egypt. <laughs> anyway, the um, this this the drawing that I'm going to show you right now was put on the blackboard. So when I was in transportation engineering school, my professor drew this on the blackboard. He drew it, a grid of streets and a and a, a target. And he said, traditionally, value was a function of proximity to the center. The closer you were to the middle, the more valuable the land, and the, the further you got, the, the less valuable. And he, he told us that your job as a traffic engineer is to speed up the roads in the city, and what that will do is it will spread the value out. So let's say this is a, a five minute uh, drive within this area. He says if you can speed up the roads to be three times as fast, uh, that five minutes is now a lot bigger and that spreads the value out. And, and that was the theory that shaped transportation policy right across the country, funding, and um, what, it, what it, unfortunately was, it was an incorrect, it was a, a wrong-headed um, theory. They said value was a function of travel time. And we saw it here in Sulphur Springs, as, as the streets were sped up, the, the businesses closed. As the one-way streets went in, the businesses closed. And you'll notice that when we started changing it, the businesses came back. Um, value came back, people came back. So what we've learned is that these modernist values about in cities, you know, we have no issue with highways between cities, by the way, so you can get between places quickly. But in the city itself, you know, increasing s speeds and adding lanes and speeding things up, what, it ha what happens is we, we reduce our identity, we get um, worse outcomes, less vibrancy. So we witnessed that here, we witnessed that in so many cities. And the solution has been going back to your roots, which we saw in 1930, and which we heard expressed this week, and we've heard before when we were doing the, doing the plaza, of these values. So we've heard loud and clear, traditional values are what are important, is what is important here. And we want to reflect those in the planning and in the, um, in the regulations. So instead of continuing doing the wrong thing and hoping for a better outcome, We'd like to re-regulate the city so you get the outcomes that you want. So here is um, here's the current land use plan, and uh, so there's a thin veneer of commercial on the on the old front of Market Road, and and if we were fo were to follow it, we would continue to export value and spend our, our money on building roads out here in the, in the more sprawling areas which create auto-dependent neighborhoods, which create parking problems downtown, which exacerbate the, um, the amount of infrastructure per taxpayer. Right now, you have a lot of infrastructure and not enough money to maintain it. With this pattern, you'll have even more infrastructure 
and fewer taxpayers per foot of road to pay for it. So it's a recipe of digging yourselves in a deeper hole. So we, we want to change this pattern so that you will have the funds to rebuild your infrastructure and rebuild your inner neighborhoods um, and keep your core healthy. Still grow, but grow in a healthy manner in accordance with your values. Your values don't say um, develop up here and subsidize all of, all of this at the expense of the core. So this is what um, the modernists say, uh, that the local streets are about access, uh, collectors are a bit about access and a bit about throughput, and your arterial streets, the big streets that come in, are all about throughput, they're just for moving traffic. Traditionally, um, arterials do move through traffic, but they also have a big access role. And when you, when you look at um, your arterials, this is what happens to be from suburban Detroit, but if you look at the arterials, you can see this is where all the jobs are, this is where the food is, the services. This is the energy corridor in Houston. So even in a very modern city like Houston, the market wants to be on the arterials. So this is where their jobs are, this is where their shopping is, and their services. And when you look here in Sulphur Springs, you know, there's you got Main Street, you got Broadway, you got Church, and this is where your businesses are. This is where your food is found, your restaurants. And um, so the modernists would like us to think that these streets are about just throughput to get past quickly. But this is where all your jobs are. This is where people would like to go. Um, so there's a big access role for those streets. And, and one of the things you said in the survey online and in person here was you want these corridors to be nicer, you want them more beautiful, you want a nice arrival experience in the town. So that speaks to the role of these being access oriented, business friendly, um, multimodal. So does that make sense? That your corridors want to be designed to, to support what's on the sides as well as um, being able to drive down them? So vision map. So um, this is the vision map we created, and um, there's a big park component, and then you've got the kind of the, the older urban core of the city. You've got the, the, the downtown, you've got the urban uh, core neighborhoods, and you've got some urban corridors. Those three types of spaces in your in your urban center, and then you've got outside of that the areas that grew later on. Um, you've got the, the suburban centers, corridors, and neighborhoods, and they extend um, up to what we call the Pentagon, which is this five-sided shape, and then beyond the Pentagon. There's a little difference between what's in the Pentagon and what's outside the Pentagon. Because of the highways, there's only so many ways you can get across from one side to the other, so they naturally have a, a bigger block structure. So there's a little bit of difference between those, but um, those are the, the suburban areas. And then you've got what we call the rural areas. And the direction that we'd suggest, based, based on your values, is to stop rewarding the problem and start rewarding your values and the solution is to uh, make your city better. So, um, so we're suggesting a, a planning direction which encourages um, low densities in the rural, very low densities in the rural areas. So you have the money to reinvest in your infrastructure and your and your core neighborhoods and your and your downtown and your corridors. If we keep building low um, so it's a sprawling type development out here, that will consume your your money and you won't have the money to invest in your existing neighborhoods um, that you would you would like. So so we have a how the comp plan works as a vision. And there's a whole series of goals, and you can see some of them written up um, around the room. And then that comes to even more objectives. Each goal has a bunch of objectives after it. And then each objective has a bunch of action items. And there's probably over 100 of them that were, were suggested. So we'll go through each one for about five or 10 minutes, and we'll be here until like next week. No, um, I'm just gonna go through a few of them, and just to give you a, a taste of what some of them are. And then, once these actions start happening, there's um, 
there's outcomes. And if we did it properly, all of those values and vision and so forth result in the outcomes that you're looking for. That's how, that's how the idea works. So this is a draft vision statement. Sulphur Springs is the best small city in Texas for raising a family, celebrating life, and doing business. <coughs> you went through a big branding exercise recently with Celebration, and you actually do that really well um, down in the square. Um, raising a family, family values came through strongly, and doing business, we want, this, we want to attract business, keep business, keep it healthy. Um, and those three things, we heard that over and over. This, this is a draft. Um, uh, we can kick it around some more until it's just right. Um, but that's kind of what we heard loud and clear. Some of the goals, um, like we said, there's land use goals, facility goals, economic goals, parks, culture, streets, utilities, and how to fund it. Uh, so an example is stabilize and reinforce existing neighborhoods. You know, that came through loud and clear. Um, a lot of focus has been on the downtown. You still need to keep doing things for your downtown to keep that energy going. But we start needing to start um, thinking about and working on the neighborhood. So proactive code enforcement, reinvestment programs, plans, each neighborhood should um, start working on a plan. Uh, urban design to help foster walking and cycling. There's um, a lot of folks who are looking for sidewalks and this sort of thing, uh, connecting their neighborhoods to trails so you can get places. Um, and then preserving the historic uh, fabric of the the neighborhoods, the buildings, and the character. That, that was a, a, a big uh, goal for people. Uh, an example of an economic development goal is to provide a, a range of retail shopping dining uh, so they have choices for yourselves and your visitors. And some of the objectives that came out of that was to expand the downtown mixed use district. There's a lot of support for that. Um, encourage convenient retail uses within walking distance of the downtown, grocery store, dry cleaner, pharmacy. And the idea is that you can live downtown or near downtown and find what you need on a daily, weekly basis nearby. So you can walk or bike or drive, but you have choices. I think that's what we heard. People wanted choices. Uh, transform these sort of auto-centric suburban commercial corridors um, to attractive frontages, sidewalks, uh, and building placement. We don't have to have um, our suburban corridors look like every other suburban corridor in the United States. They, you, you can go down some other streets and other cities and not know what city you're in. So maybe we can add some character to our suburban corridors through this effort. Uh, some folks were talking about the fronted streets on the interstate, like they look like other fronted streets on, in other communities. What can we do to change that? Uh, one thing that came out was um, that once the they used to be two-way. Because of safety issues, they went to one-way. And when they went to one-way, if you recall, the businesses took a huge hit because you could only get to the business from one direction. And um, if we could solve the safety issues, it would be great to make them two-way again. So the businesses have access from both directions, and you have a, a more um, connected network in the south part of your city. So that's something that came out of this effort. An example of parks and open space is to create a, a connected network of parks and trails and civic spaces. Uh, that's already started. You've got a really nice um, trail system started in some of your parks to the west. It would be great to connect them to the downtown down Connolly Street, which I think is underway. Uh, perhaps down Oak Gilmer, maybe up Arthur, Martin Luther King, all the way out to your new 5,000 acre park. Maybe there would be bike trails or something there. But some sort of connected park system. And you've got, um, yeah, you've already. Um, you're well on your way with that kind of type of thinking. And then streets enhance and beautify the city's gateways into downtown. Um, we've talked about that already, but that's good for businesses, it's good for your visitors, it's good for property values. And, and when these streets get changed, you can, um, the utility company, if we met with them, they would love to upgrade their utilities at the same time, and then you could uh, connect to those. <coughs> And then um, utilities, you know, we spend a lot of time with your utility providers and your city staff that, that fix the utilities. And I have to admit that you do more with less here than most cities have ever visited. You have an incredibly creative staff here 
who um, keep your sewers and water running um, resources that they have. Unfortunately, though, they, they still can't keep up. Um, so your, your aging infrastructure is getting older faster than you're fixing it. So that's, a, that's an issue. And little things like um, the sewer easements that typically follow the creeks down to the sewage treatment plant, uh, they have their trees growing in them, and these trees, the roots break the pipes, and so there's not enough resources to keep the trees clear, so it creates more breakages, which then it, it redoubles the problem. So, um, and maybe when we rehab, when we redo the, these um, sewer lines, we can maybe put a trail down the uh, creeks as well, and so we can combine some of our utility efforts with some of our open space goals. So, a lot of potential there. The, um, <clears throat> so that's for the stormwater system. There was uh, people who were very interested in renewable energy, um, solar, wind, this sort of thing. And you do have 5,000 acres now. <laughs> town, maybe some of it could be a solar farm or something. Um, broadband um, internet is becoming a necessity for a lot of people to have good uh, internet access. So starting to connect the high priority places first, like the hospitals, the emergency services, the government buildings, um, and then businesses, neighborhoods, and so on. And then, um, yeah, we talked about this rehabbing the sewers in, in the neighborhoods. So these actions, there's three types of actions. So there's policy changes, financial changes, and project changes. And we'll just go over a couple samples of those. So policy change, um, redo the development codes and policies to align with the various contexts of the city. So each context deserves its own attention so that when something gets built in a historic neighborhood, it fits in the neighborhood. When something's built in the uh, suburban corridor, it fits in and contributes to that corridor. Um, and be more user-friendly. Um, right now it's a bit opaque. We want to make it relatively transparent so that people can understand and use, use the codes easily. So this is where it gets touchy when you talk about money. Um, right now, the, the city is falling behind. So the, there's a couple of places where we can get money. One is with impact fees. Right now, the developers who are developing mostly in the outer part of the city are paying no impact fees. Yet they're creating large impacts which the entire city is subsidizing. So the idea is you have the ability to charge impact fees so they pay their way. And um, so we would suggest that because you don't have enough money and that's a good source of money and they are creating impacts. So that would be a good source of money. And then from a property tax perspective, everybody likes low property taxes. It's rational in my own self-interest to pay as little tax as I can as long as everyone else pays their taxes. And if I don't, if I could pay none, that'd be great as long as you guys are paying your taxes. Um, but, so it's rational in my own self-interest to pay as little as I can. But if everybody does it, then the, all the neighborhoods start to have declining infrastructure. And that actually harms me as an individual. So it's actually in our collective interest if we each pay enough so that we can keep up with the maintenance on our neighborhood streets and utilities. And right now, the, the amount of, that we're collecting isn't enough to keep it up for everybody, which will harm everybody if we don't do something about it. So right now, your tax rate, I think, is 44 cents for every hundred dollars. And a more normal rate would be somewhere between 50 and 65 cents uh, per hundred dollars. So I threw out a, a number of, well, what if it were 59 cents instead of 44 cents. And that would create enough revenue so we could keep up with our, our maintenance. Um, and that would be good for all the neighborhoods and everybody's property value to keep up. Um, if we don't, that means neighbors will decline and our, the values of our homes, uh, the ability to attract industry and all these other sorts of things that we want starts to decline. So we're not paying our enough right now, um, based on our analysis. So that's something we could do. And then um, there are grants 
regional, state, federal, and, and philanthropic grants to support city projects. Um, there's crowdfunding for uh, community projects. I think there's a senior center that um, that we're we're funding within the community, and that that is absolutely fantastic. That's going on here, and we should keep encouraging that sort of thing. And then um, explore savings that could be gained by consolidating duplicative duplicative city and county services. So if we could if the county and the city are providing the same services. Um, perhaps there could be a, a, an arrangement where one or the other could provide them and save everybody some money. Um, that's a, a thought. And between all of those things, uh, we could put ourselves on a, a good financial footing for, for moving forward. Um, with, and then we can have the things that we, that we all want. And then, um, in terms of projects, there's some really cool projects that have been conceived. And this is just a sample. This is the um, the town. Uh, what's it called? The town branch. Town branch. The, the creek. The it used to be kind of a sewer back in the day. It was part of a 1930s um, work make work make work project um, of this kind of um, stream that goes through the city, and it was always kind of back at house, kind of forgotten. But it's actually a really cool feature. It could be like your own little river walk. Um, and, and while we're at it, it can create a, a nice open space system. And we can make some features like this little lake down by the uh, police station. It would be a nice amenity for that part of town. But it also helps with uh, reducing flooding, which is an issue down there. So we can, we can have a win-win like a, a thing, reduce some flooding, and create um, some really nice ad addresses for, for redevelopment. And that could be part of an open space connected system, so people over here could, could walk and go down to the, to the town branch and, and have a kind of a little natural experience around the downtown. Uh, this is just a little blow up of the of the, the lake. And then perhaps um, north of the downtown, we can start thinking about how to restructure our blocks and our parking um, so that, that that can be more attractive for for infill. And then with regard to streets, this is the current um, kind of framework plan for the streets, and, it, and it's all based on that sort of modernist hierarchy system. In fact, the words even say so, like it's major thoroughfares. So Main Street is a major thoroughfare, and that implies, doesn't that imply speed and throughput, and not so much helping the businesses and connecting the neighborhood? Um, collective streets and then proposed streets. And again, this is a, um, um, this perpetuates that whole sprawl thing, which which costs you a ton of money and creates um, outcomes which are not in keeping with your values. So um, that's probably not a good direction to continue with. One of the issues with that system is its reliance on big roads, particularly um, outside of that uh, Pentagon. Your town was built, your city was built on traditional values which talks about street networks. And so here are two pieces of street network. This has three east-west streets and two north-south streets, all of which are two lanes. Here's one six-lane road with a four-lane road. Same number of lanes. <coughs> which one has the town values associated with it and which one does not speak to your town values? Like this one, you could actually imagine yourself walking across the street and having a, a fabric in scale with what you what you like. This one tends to be a much larger scale, uh, which does not have that small town feel, which everybody likes. Same number of lanes. However, this one will actually outperform this one in terms of car carrying capacity. You could probably drive faster on this one, but in the city, that's, you're, you don't have a huge city. Um, it's not like you're going 30 miles. You're, you're going relatively short distances in the city. But if you're turning left, there's six ways to turn left here. There's only one here. So this needs a signal with long signal timing. You're sitting there burning gas, uh, waiting for the signal. So this tends to be more um, town friendly. So there's your, this is what I was calling that Pentagon, that sort of Pentagon shape. There's the downtown. And these are these areas that could develop, and if they develop according to 
the patterns that are happening today that will probably develop in this sort of cul-de-sac disconnected pattern. And you can see the development that's happened here, and down the south here, and out here. These developments <coughs> don't connect to anything. They're independent places, um, which you are having to pay for all the maintenance. So they contribute nothing to the public welfare of getting around. Here, they're all connected. And so this is, a, this, is, this is in keeping with your values, and this is, this is not. And these would probably develop in that same kind of pattern. Now the oldest part, if you look at this part, this development down here, just off Mockingbird, the first part of it was developed, and it had connections ready to go so the next developer could connect to it, which was really smart. But then the next person who came along didn't connect. And so now um, you've got a whole bunch of disconnected uh, Developments down there. So that's the kind of pattern that doesn't speak to your values. So, in these areas that might redevelop, you might want to do a um, a plan for that. So I just picked an area. This is not a real plan, by the way. If it were to develop according to the sort of modernist values, it would it would be all independent places, and they wouldn't connect. And what that does is it externalizes all of the traffic issues of those developments on to the rest of the network, onto, onto the rest of us. So all their traffic goes on just a couple of streets, which means those couple of streets have to be really big, they become barriers, and create traffic issues around town. As opposed to more of a connected network where the streets share the loads, each street can be a smaller scale and in keeping with your kind of small town charm and, and values, which is important to you, and, um, and create a more permeable connected network. So this isn't, this isn't the plan for the area, it's just a, a cartoon, but the idea is that somebody's got to sit down and really think through this network so that when it develops, that it makes sense for your city and is in keeping with your values. So from a street perspective, getting the network right is important. We call it the bones of the city. Get the bones right, and then, and then each street needs to be designed also within your values. So what we're suggesting, you know, I just made these street names up, Jones Street, Smith Street, and Johnson Street. So what we're suggesting for the, the street design guidelines is that um, develop guidelines which shows what's there now in terms of number of lanes and then shows what you would like it to become over time. And do that for, you only have 123 miles of streets in your city. So we can actually go through and stipulate what each one of those streets wants to be in the long run. Now a lot of them will be the same, like a lot of the neighborhood streets will be very similar, but there's a few key streets, you know, like Oak, Gilmer, um, Main, Jefferson, you know, these, um, Church, uh, Houston, these are this, these streets need uh, a little bit more attention, and they probably have, you know, different characters as you move along them. So we can think that through and, and actually just uh, specify it. So, so the, well, the cool thing is that, so when the Texas Department of Transportation comes along and says, hey, we're going to rebuild Main Street from here to here, we can open this up and say, okay, here's what we want. And when we talked to the, we had the Texas DOT representative here, he said, we would love to help you, but you need a plan. Um, and so, if we have a plan, then we could probably get them to build streets in accordance with our values. So that's what this would would help. And, that, and this kind of street would, again, help our businesses on the sides, connect our neighborhoods, be bikeable, be walkable, um, and all the sorts of things that we would like to see. It'd be beautiful. So at the end of the day, if we do all of these things um, that we've been talking about, what it does is it, it, it changes the dynamic, like right now the, the systems game to um, disadvantage the core and advantage the edge. And what we're trying to do is level the playing field so that the, the, the older parts that sit in the core can, can be um, maintained properly and we can um, reduce the effects of sprawl and the cost that that occurs on the city. So the city can grow uh, without the expense of sprawl and you keep your charm and historic neighborhoods um, intact and fill in. You've got plenty of infill property uh, to, to grow 
for quite some time. So that's the thrust of the comp plan. The comp plan is, this, like I said, big, big ideas, goals, objectives, action items, and each one is a it's all it's all aligned back to the goals and the vision, which came from your values. And if we keep them consistent throughout the board, anytime anything gets built, it speaks to those values and your vision. So that's. That's what we're recommending. Um, so the next steps is um, we're going to have a discussion after this, and then we'll take what we've there's a like I said, there's a lot more detail on the laws, um, but we'll take all of that and we'll put it into a document, a uh, draft document, and then it'll come back to the city. Um, they'll be they'll get kicked around a little bit, and then um, and then we'll revise it, and that will become your your revised comp plan will help guide you for the next 20 years or, or so. So any, um, so maybe if somebody knows where the lights are, we could turn lights on. And um, so then we'll, we'll take some time and do comments and questions and um, see what folks think.
are all these ingredients in place? And, um, and here, they, a lot of it is in place already, but a few things are falling behind, like the infrastructure um, investments. But that's what they, they want. If, if they think a city's going to fall apart in, in 10 years, um, and that their employees may not want to live there, they'll probably not come. But if they can see a high quality of life, which you, which you are well on your, on your way to providing, if you, they see you're rebuilding yourself and pulling up your, your shortcomings and celebrating your strengths, um, yeah, that's the kind of thing industry wants. I was involved in the city of West Palm Beach, was, which was a highly challenged city uh, in the 90s. I used to be the head of the transportation there. And we, our, our utilities were falling apart. Some of our streets were literally came in with all the clay pipes. And one of the things that we did to help attract um, businesses and people with choice back to the city was start fixing our infrastructure. We still had to work on our downtown to make it cool and fun, but we had to get our, our kind of our hard work done as, as well. And we also, um, one of the super strengths here is your water. You've got a fantastic sewer plan and your water strategies are, are better than practically anywhere else in Texas. Um, that's one thing that we do in West Palm Beach too. So we, um, different, different type of problem, but the same outcome. And that kind of thing helps attract businesses. So you have to work on your shortcomings, celebrate your strengths, and, and create that predictability, and I think you'll be in good shape. You, you can provide here in a, in a small city things that cannot be provided in, in large cities. That's the sort of quality of life and the type of values you just can't get that in, the, in big places. So you have an edge in certain markets, and, and I think you are, um, you can have all the folks in your staff understand that. Yes? Well, we already have in place several industrial parks out in the country around the city, so the people who live in the city and work in the country. Yeah, you're already, you're, you're, you're well on your way, and, uh, and I think your industrial parks are doing really well, too. Um, so. Yeah, you, 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 you've got a lot of going through already, and you just got to keep the momentum up. One, one thing you cannot get is complacence. Um, never get complacent. It, there's always another city trying to outcompete you, so you have to keep, keep the uh, pressure on. Yes, ma'am? Is there a plan for recycling and green efforts if we address that at all? Yeah, there's, um, we only could put up a sample of the initiatives, but in the um, on the back you'll see that yeah, recycling and green infrastructure. There's stuff about um, reducing pervious surfaces to, to reduce flooding. Um, there's recycling effluent, um, so you, you just don't dispose of all your effluent. You actually put it back into the system. There's um, there's an idea of using. Um, I don't know all the words for it, biofiltration to remove certain chemicals out of the water so before it goes into the natural system it's cleaned up. And so there's a whole bunch of things underway now and we're and we've listed a few more as well. So yeah, there's a there's a green component in that as well. There's the the stuff about renewable energy that we talked about a little bit. So there's a, a number of angles that are in the objectives. Some of them are already underway. Um, there's always more we can do there, of course. Um, but I, I think that's a, an important thing that, that um, people want to move here, will be looking for, and employers want to look for. And it's just good um, stewardship of the environment. Yeah. Here and there. Yes, sir. How far will your plan go towards the engineering solutions that will support implementing it? At what point will that be handed off? So um, we've kind of promised a process, and so what we're going to do is we're going to advance as many of these objectives as far as we can, uh, and then stop. <laughs> and then, um, but we want to leave you with a product which tells you next steps. Um, any one of these things we could have spent our entire budget on, just one little aspect of them. So there's. There's like 50 things going on at the same time. And we'll take them as far as we can. There's some projects that we would like to provide more detail on, like um, like the town branch, for example, perhaps the cross-section of Main Street, some, some more tangible things that could happen quickly. 
Um, and the other ones we're going to have to leave fairly loose, you know, just because we just don't have the, the time to do that. And they'll have to be sequenced in the, the priorities um, and advanced at the time where um, where we need more detail. So um, that's kind of a wishy-washy answer, but so we'll try and get to the the key priorities first and give you more detail on those, and then the 50 other things we'll give you less detail on. Yes, sir. I like the plan, and you guys are thinking about a lot of things like outside the box about the steps and But there's one thing that I think that you need to take into consideration, and I think it's you talk about tradition, you talk about it. In the 1950s, the interstate came through such a break. I was approximately 16 years old. And the city limits was at where the taller was forecast. That period of time, and obviously we know what the city is even now in South, so I'm trying to say what the fact I know. The growth of this community has always been a tradition, as a tradition, it's going south. And if you go back and look, you see much more built in all those areas, but it just be housing, especially housing. Uh, you know, so one of the things that I'm hoping that you're taking into consideration is that area that you're there. Because we just found out through the brand spanking new loop. It was in the south. And we're going to put it out right now. And there you go. Anyway, that is obviously a tradition. It's just been going on for a while. So, that being that respect. Yeah, so, so the interstate did go to the south. And um, consequently, um, development followed the interstate. There's there's a kind of a pattern in, in any country, the United States, where infrastructure drives land use. And in the olden days, when two rivers would meet and boats would meet transportation, that's where cities developed. When rail came along, you'd see the trolley lines going out into the into the rural areas and becoming the first trolley neighborhoods. Um, and then you'll see places like Atlanta develop at the intersection of rail tracks and rail tracks. And, and then when um, cars came along, you could develop anywhere that you could build a road, which was just about anywhere. And then, of course, the interstates came along and reshaped uh, land uses tremendously. And when that came, came scale, the, the scale of the infrastructure changed the scale of retailing. So you'll notice when the highways come through, the, the big box phenomenon came, and they all was located near interchanges because that was the new, def the modern definition of access. And so what happened was, in place, traditional cities like here, instead of the, um, the merchants distributing the goods into stores around the community, the, the truck would come off the interstate, dump the pallets in a, more or less a warehouse, and you would drive all the way to that, and end up publicly subsidizing the big boxes distribution system at the public expense. And that's that's what's causing the financial problems now, is that the amount of infrastructure to do that, compared to the number of taxpayers paying for it, is, um, is not penciling out anymore. So, it, so what we did was when we were doing the kind of the vision planning, was we, where the city limits are now, there's, there's different rights people have, where we preserve all of those rights. Um, beyond that, though, that's where we can, as a like a good emergency room doctor, the first thing they do is they do no more harm. <coughs> so, what we're thinking about is beyond the the, the limits of the the city and the current um, zoning and, and where people have property rights, is to start um, looking at these more sustainable models. Um, and in those southern areas. Instead of just leaving it to um, private interests, because if you are a developer in a, in, a, in private business, you are going to act rationally in your own self-interest. Just like remember those developments I showed you; those developers acted rationally in their own self-interest, and it, it's and it's rational in their own self-interest not to connect to other developments. But if everybody was to do that then it harms the whole southern part of the city. And it's just like me, it's rational in my own self-interest not to want to pay taxes. 
as long as everyone else does it. So the test is if everyone does the same thing, and if it harms the city, then it's bad public policy. So allowing the development pattern that's going on now to continue is bad public policy. So what we're suggesting in the regulations is to create some suburban development codes which respects the context such that we don't get those outcomes in the future. Keeps all the rights in place, but it allows each developer to um, work in such a way that when it's all said and done, the end product is actually more valuable than if every single person was to act rationally in their own, in their own self-interest. So that's, the, that's a legitimate role of local government, is to help shape the outcomes so that at the end of the day, we're not collectively as a city paying an enormous amount of taxes to ameliorate the effects of bad planning. Yes, sir? I want to speak a little bit to that, the growth pattern. Uh, when I came here 20 years ago, I aided the infrastructure. And lately, I went back to the old Storm uh, Sandborn map and noticed that Salt Springs is really two towns. In the 1930s, there were about 8,200 people. You can see that town. The growth pattern is exactly right. The growth pattern is since the 40s. When the car and all those other factors came in, the whole growth model changed. The old town has been virtually deserted as far as attention, and it's been slowly dying. Infrastructure-wise, I've been trying to figure out how to pay for it to get it renewed. And it's not 32%, it's actually 39% of the sewer lines and water lines that are now depleted and are soon not to work. We have, we just ignored it. And then the growth patterns on the new uh, developments are all islands. So that they don't work together. So you have to pay for almost twice as much infrastructure per mile for what you're getting out of it. And so each of those neighborhoods, people buy into those homes, and then we try to figure out how to afford to replace them, and, and the fact that they're built by two or three times. So the idea here is, is to go get bypass surgery, start pumping blood back into the full amount back into those neighborhoods so they start becoming vibrant again. In other words, the interconnection becomes important again rather than us just speeding out, like I live in Pleasant Grove, so I'm, I'm, I'm one of those that have caused harm. Is that I drive up that highway seven miles, I come back seven miles, and that is not as healthy as a relationship as it would be having bought into those 1920 uh, neighborhoods that what we used to do. So, I mean, that's, that's the idea, in other words, to try to figure out what we left behind that was actually, that actually worked in many ways better than what we've created since. So it's not that we didn't grow down there, but how we grew is, I think, the issue. Yeah, and how we'll continue to grow. If we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to be in big trouble. So we have to change something. And um, we've seen enough patterns around to know that um, these sorts of things that we're suggesting are much healthier financially, <coughs> socially, um, character-wise. It just so happens they align with the values of the, the city, which just happen to be traditional. But yeah, this, and it's in our city interest for everybody that we not ignore these infrastructure things any longer. Because if the core does collapse, where we just kind of have to walk away, it's just too expensive, and no one's going to come and bail us out. Like the federal government's not going to come in and suddenly pay for all this stuff. So if we don't look after it ourselves, we're going to have a serious issues which will then harm the, the whole. Yes, sir. Based on this comprehensive plan you're going to give us, we've talked about a lot of different things we'd all like to see. And the biggest thing is you say we don't have enough money, and I'm sure we don't. Uh, in your plan, are you going to uh, weigh the infrastructure against the project here? I mean, give us a, a, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, a 15-year plan, uh, based on these things that you, know, that you found out. Or are you going to give us some of those priorities? Uh, we would love to. Um, we probably don't have the resources as part of this contract to do it, but that's that's one of those next steps that you, you would want to stage this out in a logical a logical way. Yeah. That would make a lot of sense. Well, there's one thing we've talked about a lot of people different ways, and I guess we've got to be kind of right. Uh, it's been my impression, I think, most probably it's impressive, but the reason why we've been Sales tax. Mm -hmm. Driving this for a long period of 
back. And of course, once again, we all know where they get sales back from. Well, obviously, this is one thing that we certainly have to think that our, our final, to think that it is there was a high pride of the period. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a good point. What he brought up for you, as you couldn't hear, was sales tax has been paying for just about everything so far, and, and it's really important today and will continue to be important. And we need to continue to encourage development to get more sales tax. Uh, unfortunately, it's just insufficient. Um, to cover the costs. So sales tax is one source, but it's not enough. Um, so yeah, we, it's really important, it, but it's, again, it's insufficient, so we have to look at other sources. Um, and then this side of the room has been pretty quiet. <laughs> Any thoughts? Anybody who's been sitting on an idea that really wants to share? Okay, um, is any of the um, other parts of the team would like to, are you okay? Okay, how about staff? Um, any, any of the staff folks want to weigh in with anything? We're good? Okay. So like I said, next steps, um, we're going to take what we heard, um, take what we wrote down, write up a plan, and submit it in a, I can't remember exactly the date, but submit it, and then we'll get some comments back, and then we'll have a, a, an up-to-date comp plan. So lastly, I just want to thank um, the staff, um, Peter, Mark, Gail, Tori, everybody who helped um, Mike with all the maps, um, creating the space, feeding us, like they, the pizzas under the door at night for us. And, uh, <laughs> they were the, and the hospitality uh, was, was fantastic. And then um, all of the people, <clears throat> your, we had a steady stream of your, your commissioners and everybody coming through, making sure that things were, were cool. Um, we met with your developers, your utility people, all those people helped help make this happen. So I just want to thank everybody for coming in, the regular citizens, the, the people who own property who are concerned about it, came in and talked to us, um, parks people, you know, it was, uh, it was a, real, a real community effort. And they, what did they say, to build a city, it takes a village or something like that? <laughs> anyway, um, so it, it, one of the things that I took away from this whole thing is that everybody who came and participated, everyone here tonight, loves this city and cares about it deeply. And I think um, I think that came through, and I think it's coming through in your values. And and we're going to get a an agreement on how we want to move together and keep this place going in a, in the manner we want it to go. In. So thank you so much for that, and I look forward to supplying you with a, a really great draft report soon. Have a good night, everyone.